Thank you. Thank you, Joining sir. Steve now to explore the emotional economy is John Clifton, CEO of Gallup. Hey, John. Sir, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, we've had quite a day here um, sorting through lots of issues, but the one issue that we haven't gone until just a minute ago to try to talk about where the world global psychology today is, you know, how, how are people feeling? You know, sometimes it gets wrapped up into, you know, are we happy, are we unhappy? But I know it's much more complex than that. But when you kind of look at what um, Gallup does, Gallup does a global poll, Gallup does lots of polls, but, you know, you've written a lot about this lately. Tell us about the stress levels and happiness levels in the world. Well, to be clear, they're not good. Um, How not good are they? <laughs> so, you know, about 70 years ago, when Simon Kuznets approached Congress, he came up with this novel idea and said, let's put a number to figure out whether or not the economy is getting bigger or shrinking. And, of course, that number that we know today is GDP. Mm. And now leaders have become addicted to uh, global economic indicators. But what they don't have indicators on is how people feel. And so if you ask a leader, is there more stress in the world today than there was 10 years ago? Is there more anger? Is there more sadness? Their answer would have been, I don't know, because they can't put a number on it. And so Gallup went out and actually tried to address this hmm. almost 20 years ago. We went out into 150 countries and just simply asked people if they're experiencing debilitating stress. And what we found in the past 10 years is that negative emotions in 150 countries have been rising consistently. And it's what some have called the other global warming. So what does stress in, say, Brussels look like compared to, say, Bali? Let's take an example right here in the United States, because I think there are a lot of people that feel like stress is getting out of control here in the U.S. But what I think is most interesting is, is that the levels of stress, anger, sadness haven't changed since 2006. But here's what's really interesting. If you rank America against the rest of the world, in 2006 we were 20th. Today we're 50th. The only reason America dropped in its rankings is because the rest of the world caught up in terms of negative emotions. So we were one of the highest, and again, the only reason that we've dropped is not because we got less sad or less anxious, it's because the rest of the world caught up to us. Now, you've written recently that productivity in OECD countries has been falling. You've been also talked a little bit about quiet quitting, etc. Couldn't you look at this data and say that's a good thing? That productivity is declining? Well, productivity declining may be bad for companies, but maybe it means people are living higher quality lives. How so? I don't know. Stepping back. Well, and I mean, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to invert the, you know, the data that, that, and, and the logic that you know, productivity, people engage at work, et cetera, you know, the machine, um, all of that is a certain model of a social contract versus what we began to see, particularly after the 0809 financial crisis, you know, some people, young people, you know, being forced because there were no jobs, having hybrid lives, you know, some driving Ubers, some doing different things here and there. But if you went out and polled a lot of them and said, hey, we live a higher quality life than our parents, we have control over our schedules again. And I'm just interested in this question of happiness then, sure. of like, are we seeing the, the, the destruction of the old work contract and do, are we not seeing emerge green sprouts of an alternative way of organizing, you know, kind of Andrew Yang type stuff? Well, I think one of the greatest fallacies in terms of what leadership is trying to do is we are trying to invent every way possible to run as far away from work as possible. And so we come up with these concepts like work-life balance or pass a law that says that your boss can't email you after 5 p.m. You know what the problem with that is? It assumes that human beings can compartmentalize. That if your boss berated you at noon just because he can't email you after five, that you won't take that emotional baggage home with you afterward. It's wrong. And I think one of the great challenges of leaders today is improving the conditions of the workforce. And the reason I say that is because, well, not only if you look at the ILO statistic, I, I think it's three million people actually die working every single year. But outside of the actual numbers of deaths, 
how much emotional pain is work actually causing us mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. I think this is one of the biggest discoveries that Gallup has ever had in our 80-year history, which is if you look at the anger, stress, sadness, pain, and worry of someone who is totally miserable at work, someone who is actively disengaged, their daily pain looks more like someone who has no work whatsoever compared to their other peers that are in the workplace. So as you sort of sort out, you know, when you give people sort of counsel, as you deal with so many leaders and businesses, you run them through and test it, do you see a pathway back, um, not for the world necessarily, but for pockets of the world that you can dent, um, that deals in a constructive way, in a forward way, with um, levels of satisfaction, you know, self-attainment, um, um, you know, c uh, contentment, happiness. The path is not rocket science, but we often joke that we're closer to colonizing Mars than we are to fixing the world's broken workplace. We find that the things that highly correlate, not just with productivity, but also with worker well-being, is getting a basic understanding of whether or not people know what's expected of them at work. Think about that very basic concept. Now, if you pose that question to workers globally, all 3.3 billion people who are in the work, workforce, and say to them, do you know what's expected of you? Do you know what percent can't fully agree to that? It's half. Hmm. Half. So a lot of times we get into these concepts about let's fix worker well-being, and we think about how do we build more pathways to yoga or how do we build a volleyball court? And what they don't realize is that most of the time workers don't really have what they need in order to do their job effectively and it drives them absolutely nuts. One of the things we find that highly correlates with stress, this is one of the single indicators that highly correlates with it, is do you have the things you need at work to do your job effectively? Hmm. Think about that. And again, many times CHROs, what they're trying to do is they go, let me improve well-being. We'll invest in a whole bunch of yoga mats. When someone's really committed to their job and they're saying, I don't have what I need in order to do my job, and they see yoga mats hit the floor, it makes them even angrier because they say, why are you spending money on that when I can't even get the resources I need in order to do my job effectively? And so I think a lot of times when people talk about worker well-being, they're thinking about programs that aren't necessarily specific to the job. And the last thing I'll say on that, there was this amazing podcast with Adam Grant, and he hosted Nobel laureate Danny Kahneman, who, of course, is the first winner of the Nobel Prize in economics, even though he's also a psychologist. But he says to him, Adam Grant asked Danny Kahneman, he says, he goes, do you think we've gone too hard on engagement? Do you think we should be focusing more on the overall well-being of the worker? And Danny Kahneman, for those of you that, that know him, he kind of lets out a gasp and he goes, <sighs> he says, well, that's more your field than mine. He said, but I don't know that it is the role of an organization to focus on the entire well-being of a person, but I do think it is their role to focus on their well-being at work. And that's why I think they should care about things like whether or not they have an opportunity to do what they do best or whether or not they have good friends within the workplace. Those are the emotional aspects that I think create a flourishing workplace. And I also think it speaks to stakeholder or shareholder capitalists. Let me just ask you finally, um, because you do poll the whole world basically, you go out and talk to them. Um, where, who's got, if, please don't mention a Scandinavian country, but, you know, are there, are there any um, happy, uh, relatively happy uh, quotients, workplace uh, situations that we might look at or emulate other than Denmark? Well, just a minute. I, I, for, I need to get something off my chest. Yeah. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the World Happiness Report, who are the happiest countries. You've heard that Finland is the happiest country in the world. If you read the very, very, very small print, that's actually Gallup's data. Okay. And if you ask man or woman on the street in Finland, what is it like to be the happiest person in the world? Because many have. Uh, one minister actually said back to him, if we're the happiest people in the world, I'd hate to see the other countries. <laughs> and the reason for that is we're not necessarily measuring happiness. We're measuring contentment. So really what it is is they're the most content people in the world, not necessarily the happiest. And if you ask who the people are on the planet who experience the most joy, it's Latin Americans. 
There's huh. no one that knows how to have fun more than Latin Americans, and they are very open about it. Um, now, when it comes to the workplace, I just want to share one finding that I think is shocking um, and also fascinating because they're famous for their 996 culture, which means working 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. And if you ask Elon who Musk, who? I'm, I was going okay, okay. to drop that. Yeah. I was trying to give the build up. Okay, build it up, build it up. <laughs> I thought I missed what you said it was. Go ahead. No, no. Um, but anyway, even if you ask Elon Musk about it, and he's opening a bunch of factories, he said they don't burn the midnight oil. They burn the 3 p.m. or excuse me, the 3 a.m. oil, and it's China. Huh. And a lot of people think that it's a workplace culture that's burning people out. But if you look at our engagement surveys, they're actually figuring it out, and people do feel more emotionally attached. And I think you actually see it in their productivity at a national level. So I think that's one of the most fascinating trends of the past 15 years. And I'll just say that Boulder is allegedly the happiest little town in America, you know, but I don't know why. It's also, I think that's also our data. <laughs> yeah, that's your data too. So anyway, John Clifton, CEO of Gallup, thank Thanks you so much me. for hosting us and having us here today and sharing with us the emotional uh, intelligence thing. Let me tell you